what are the motives? What motivates somebody to say things that are misleading or untrue? Well, it's complicated. I mean, obviously, different people have different motivations. And if you look at, say, the fossil fuel industry, it's pretty clear what their interest is. They're trying to protect their product in much the same way that the tobacco industry tried to protect its product. Um, and we now know that fossil fuel burning is dangerous, right? Um, but I've been studying specifically the scientists involved who are real scientists. So I'm not talking about PR people and spin people. I mean, there's a lot of that as well. But I've been studying the scientists who have been involved in this. And, and it's, it's a complicated story, but it involves people um, who, for the most part, are not climate scientists and, for the most part, do not actually do research on climate and have, for the most par part, published no original scientific research of their own. What they have done is attack existing science or challenge the existing science to say that the data were exaggerated, to claim the data had been misinterpreted. In some cases, they've actually attacked individual scientists, and sometimes it's gotten quite ugly involving ad hominem attacks on climate scientists. So why would scientists, why would distinguished and reputable scientists do that? Why would they attack science? Why would a scientist attack science? So that's been my question. And the answer is complicated, but it goes like this. So most of these people are physicists. Most of them, the most prominent ones, have actually been, or were, some of them are deceased now, were retired physicists. Most of them were physicists who had worked on Cold War weapons, rocketry, and satellite programs. And all of them shared, or most of them shared, a very strong anti-Soviet, anti-communist political ideology. And somewhere along the line, in the late 19, mid to late 1980s, particularly in the late 1980s and the early 1990s, as the Cold War came to an end, it's as if they needed to find a new enemy. And some of these people became convinced that environmentalists were actually communists in disguise. It was, in fact, the old reds under the bed mentality they even used expressions describing environmentalists as reds dressed in green, pinks dressed in green, reds disguised as green, reds in green makeup. And they became convinced that, I mean, after all, think about the Cold War. The Cold War was about fighting for freedom. It was about fighting for a free market system in which individuals are free to make political, social, and economic choices. And they began to see regulation as a kind of creeping communism and to fear that the United States would be strangled by too much regulation. And so they began to oppose a whole set of environmental regula regulatory issues. And it's not just global warming. Many of these same people were involved in trying to stop um, the Montreal Protocol on substances that deplete the stratospheric ozone. Some of them were involved in issues over acid rain, uh, secondhand tobacco smoke tobacco, a whole set of issues in which the U.S. government was moving in the 1980s and 90s to regulate dangerous substances. And in each case, their arguments were always consistent, always on the side of opposing regulation and defending the dangerous substance as, well, not really that dangerous, claiming that the dangers were exaggerated, claiming that it was hysteria, that people were overreacting, that it was exaggerated, um, that we were, you know, shrill, we were panicking, and that really everything would be all right if we didn't just overreact. And so in each case, these people argued against proposed regulations. And I think that they honestly believed, I think they honestly thought that they were fighting to defend freedom as they understood it. Um, so the way I've been thinking about it recently, you know, Barry Goldwater at the height of the Cold War famously said that extremism in the f defense of liberty is no, is no vice. I think that's how they thought about it. I think that they thought, well, they were extremists. They were taking a very extreme view. They were taking a view that was way, way, way outside the mainstream of scientific opinion. But I think that they believed that they were doing it in defense of freedom. And that's how they could justify it. And that's how they could justify the misrepresentations.